So within philosophy, oftentimes it's said that there are a number of, of problems that philosophy is trying to answer. These are sometimes described as the classical problems of philosophy. Now, the interesting thing about these classical problems of philosophy is a lot of them really aren't classical problems at all, but they develop sometime within the 17th century, specifically through the philosophy of someone like Rene Descartes uh, and what is often known as modern philosophy, the philosophy that develops in the modern world, the post-Reformation world, moving away from um, discussions that were in the Middle Ages and in the classical Greek era uh, and Roman eras as well. But one of those classical problems, supposedly, is the mind-body problem. Uh, and this posits that there is a problem in terms of the relationship of body and mind, uh, which says that essentially we are physical beings in one sense, but we are also mental beings in another sense. And there is a difficulty among philosophers in trying to figure out how those two things work together. So there are certain questions that people raise, such as how can something that is mental or non-physical impact that which is physical? Sometimes, um, you know, more materialist philosophers will say that doesn't make sense because um, you can't, a mental thing can't transfer energy to a physical thing. Uh, so therefore, it can have no impact on a physical thing at all. And, and this discussion really starts with, with Rene Descartes. The reason I say it starts with, with Rene Descartes is he develops his own kind of unique understanding of, of the relationship between the mental and, and the physical. So in short, and we could get into Descartes' philosophy um, in many other ways, but just to kind of summarize what, what the problem is that he sets up, is he argues that the human person is essentially these two different substances, uh, two very different substances, um, completely different substances, which is where the term substance dualism comes from, that there are two different kinds of substances. One is a mental substance and the other is a physical substance. And these two kinds of substances make up the human person. Now, they're two very different kinds of things. So a lot of questions rise then is how can these two very different kinds of things essentially existing on two totally different planes interact with each other at all. And Descartes really didn't have a way to understand how the physical and mental interact at all. Uh, and so when we're talking about the mental, this this connects with the idea of the soul. It's, it's the non-physical aspect of, of the human person. Now, Descartes had a kind of uh, unique view, at least among Christians, of how he viewed the physical world. And he viewed the physical world mechanistically, meaning that he thought that the physical world was basically just a machine that God created, and this soul substance was in some ways just kind of a, a separate thing infused into this otherwise just purely mechanical world uh, that was in, in the human person. So a, a way to, you know, show this impact in his thought, for example, is to look at how he looked at animals. Um, so he basically viewed animals as, as machines, that they had no inner consciousness at all, which I think is a very strange view. Uh, and so in Descartes' view, then, animals don't have souls, only humans have souls. So we have a basically mechanistic world or mechanistic universe with just this one thing that becomes mental or maybe supernatural, depending on how you define that term, which is the human soul. And so the human soul is of a completely different kind than basically everything else in the physical or, or natural world. Um, and from that point, there is, of course, a, a very big divide between soul or the mental and then the physical world. And there's this question of how do these two interact if they're so different? And following Descartes, people start to throw out the idea of, of a soul altogether or anything that is, is purely mental altogether. Now, Descartes had some, some strange ideas. Uh, for example, he would say that perhaps there is, you know, the pineal gland, this thing in the brain where which kind of connects the mental and physical substances together. Uh, some people say that, that there is this coherence between mental events and physical events in the brain that they just so happen to coincide, but one is not actually impacting the other, but that every time something is happening in, in the mind, simultaneously there are things that are actually happening in the brain, but there is no necessary causal connection between the two, um, which is a very strange kind of view. So after that, people start to just throw out this idea of the soul altogether, 
Uh, and well, if everything else is purely mechanical, why can the soul itself or the human person not just be purely mechanical as well? So maybe we are just machines like the rest of nature is. Uh, and then that idea gets basically thrown out after that in, in materialist philosophy. But if you look at thinkers before Descartes, um, you, you see that they don't view the natural world as just this basically soulless machine. Um, but they, they view all of the world as having a purpose or, or a telos or a teleology. Uh, there, there is an end in mind even in natural things. So, so it's not just like a machine where it's got a bunch of parts that run, um, but that there are individual things that God himself has created that work for particular ends or purposes. And so it's this notion that there is a purpose in everything that exists, and everything exists for its particular purpose. And so that's true of everything in the natural world. That's true of plants. That's true of, you know, the water cycle. That's true of animals. And so we can ask this question, you know, what are they for? What is their end? What is their goal? And so everything has purpose inherent within it, which is what differentiates it from a machine that is just randomly put together or happens to work in a certain fashion. So when we're talking about things like meaning or soul, we're not just then speaking in a classical view, we're not just speaking about the human person as if we're something that's so distinct from the rest of creation, but that there is a, a purpose in all of creation. And so if you look at Aristotle and Plato in the medieval tradition, it was generally understood that there are souls of a kind in other things that exist as well. There is this principle of life that exists within the, the animal kingdoms uh, as well as within plants. Now, they define different kinds of souls. Um, you know, the nutritive soul is what a plant has. that Basically, it just needs nutrients. Um, th there's an appetitive soul that animals have uh, where they have desires for to you know, to, to please their basic, you know, appetites. Uh, and I don't mean that in a way of, you know, sinful appetites, but, but just their basic needs. And they run based on instinct and things like this. Uh, and humans are distinct in that they have a, a rational soul. So what is distinctive about humans is that we can actually stop and think and reason in a way that no other thing in creation can. And so that sets humans apart as something categorically different and while humans are said to have an immortal soul, other things are not said to have an immortal soul or an eternal soul. And the only reason, of course, in a Christian perspective, we have an eternal soul is because God sustains it. Whereas in classical philosophy, there's something inherently just immortal about what a soul is so that it lasts forever necessarily. That's what you find in someone like Plato, which is obviously a difference between that and the, and the Christian view. But so to say that, that there is a soul or, or purpose or meaning or teleology within the natural world uh, is not to, to say that that is all eternal in the sense that the human soul is eternal. But it's a recognition that not everything is just purely physical in the natural world as a whole. And the natural world as a whole is, in a sense, pointing us to God because everything has an end or a goal or a purpose for which it functions. And that purpose the source of those purposes are God, and the end or the telos of, of, of everything that exists is God as well. So from him, through him, to him are all things, right? Scripture speaks in this way. Uh, so that everything comes from God and goes back to him. And that is inherent in the structure of the natural world. So what you find in Descartes when he gets rid of that is there is this, you know, divide between natural physical reality and spiritual reality, which really is just is just relegated to this substance that is the soul substance in, in man. Now, the way that Aristotle and, and the later Thomist tradition uh, defines an understanding of body and soul is not just in terms of, of two substances. Now, it might be said in Plato that, that he's a kind of substance dualist, and I know some people have equated Descartes' view with that of Plato, and there certainly are similarities, but Plato's view of the natural world is so different than Descartes' um, that I'm not sure how helpful it is to really even connect the two. But uh, Aristotle has his own way of explaining this relation between body and soul um, so that he doesn't see them as two totally fundamentally different substances, but he sees them as two parts of the same human reality. So um, yeah, to understand this, you have to have a little bit of an understanding of Aristotle's view of reality, which he calls uh, hylomorphism, or that's at least the name that's been, I don't know if 
Aristotle used it. I don't think he did actually, but it, it's the name at least that's been placed on on his view and used to categorize his view, which is to say that all things that exist are a composite of form and matter, um, except for God or absolute being, necessary being, um, which is God himself. As Christians, we know as the triune God. But uh, so so he believes that form and matter um, make up all things. Matter meaning you know the stuff that makes things up. Uh, form meaning the the what that thing is right so um you know what i'm sitting on right now is a chair right is it in the form of a chair but the matter is you know the wood that puts this chair together so the stuff that makes it up is the wood but the form or the thing that it is is a chair right so um that's a very basic simple explanation but the way that aristotle then and and thomas aquinas explain relationship between body and soul is that they're both aspects of the same thing and in that language, it's said that um, the soul is the form of the body. So the body is the matter. The soul is the form. So they're two aspects of the same thing that make up the human person. And, you know, I think that that is a little bit more of a, of a biblical way to understand the relationship between body and soul than you find in, in something like a substance dualism. Um, so while there certainly are similarities in that, you know, both views confess that there is both a material and, and a non-physical aspect to, to the human person. I think Scripture is very clear that there is, is a strong unity between body and soul and, and that we are comprehensively made as both body and soul. We're not complete uh, without body and soul, which is why the goal in the Christian life ultimately, in an eternal sense, is for body and soul to be united into one single individual, not just to be souls separated from our bodies. Um, so I, th- I think that his view makes the best sense, or at least I would say maybe it's the best human way of explaining this relationship between body and soul. Um, not to say that there is no better way to explain it <laughs> scripturally, but um, it, it's as good it's as good as one as we got, I think. And I think it, it explains it better than either the substance dualist approach, which I think has too strong of a divorce between body and soul, uh, or the materialist approach approach which basically says body is soul uh so i think those are those are problematic so i think that the way that you know aristotle thomas and that tradition defines it is the best we've got currently (laughs) right that makes the most sense of things and the scriptural data i think